Thank you so much, Pastor Roxer, and it's a joy for Norma and me to be here. I'm not sure if I see Norma back there anywhere, but be sure and uh, get acquainted. Is she there? Please, dear, would you stand up? The beautiful lady with the golden curls. <laughs> you want to meet her afterwards. Our topic this morning was at the other church, of course, on how to defend the Bible. And that is certainly relevant to our six sessions on the book of Jonah this week, because doubtless of all the books of the Old Testament, that is the one that is the least believable and the most despised and ridiculed of all the books that God wrote, in fact, in the whole Bible. And I say that advisedly because there are so many things in the book of Genesis that this modern generation cannot take seriously. But isn't it amazing, friends, that the Lord Jesus Christ deliberately, intentionally, emphatically pointed to Jonah's experience not only as real and historically true, but as prophetic of his own experience in death and resurrection. As if Jesus were saying, I know you people are going to have a problem with that book of Jonah, so I'm going to deliberately choose to emphasize the historical truth of that book. Just like he emphasized the creation of Adam and Eve, he emphasized the reality of the Genesis flood and Noah's ark, and uh, all the way through Genesis, he picked out the special things that most people consider hard to believe. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, God's judgment upon Lot's wife. I mean, the Lord knows, dear friends, the depth of our unbelief and of our depravity and our sin and rebellion against him and his word. Because we live in a generation that despises the whole idea of a supernatural, miracle-working, infinitely wise and powerful God. You know why? Because that threatens our own independence. If God is sovereign and he can implement his sovereignty with power in terms of judgment, then I don't have absolute sovereignty in the universe. And that's a threat to me, you see? That means I better get on good terms with this God which means absolute, unconditional, total surrender to him. Nothing could be more contrary to the desire of the sinful heart of man. So God, in effect, is saying, dear readers, I know there are things about the life of Jonah, his experience, that you won't like at all because God has the first word in the book and the last word, and he's the hero of the book of Jonah. I've mentioned to the pastor tonight as the group came up to sing so beautifully that uh, isn't it wonderful to see this young group of Jonahites? And he said, oh no, <laughs> we don't want these children to do what Jonah did. And then of course, we all agreed that uh, the book ends in a very fascinating way. Namely, Jonah tells it as it is about himself. He doesn't cover up anything. He totally disobeyed God from beginning to end. He was a rebel. He denied God's righteousness and his holiness and his love and mercy. But the fact that he wrote the whole book and tells bad things about himself suggests that he must have repented. <laughs> I don't hear any amens. <laughs> but just think that over, dear friends. The book is his own confession of how far from God even a believer can go, even a servant of God can go, even a leader, a prophet in his case, in rebelling against the known will of God. Now it's going to be difficult for us, friends, to fathom some of these things. We had warn you in advance, this is not an easy book to understand in the depth of the mystery and marvel of what it tells us about God and his great prophet Jonah. But with the Lord's help, 
The one who wrote the book of Jonah is ultimately, of course, the third person of the triune Godhead, whose name is the Holy Spirit. He's the author of the whole Bible through 40 writers, through 2,000 years, and he alone can tell us what he meant by what he said in this precious book and the 66 major parts of it. One sixty-sixth of the Bible is Jonah, and it's 100% part of the canonical, inspired, and fallible scriptures, never to be despised or to be degraded to the realm of just some kind of a beautiful story from long, long ago that old people and maybe children believe, but intelligent, educated, scientifically minded people couldn't possibly take seriously. God despises that attitude about his precious word. And so this morning we help, uh, tried to explore ways and means that we can help people believe the Bible. And you know what we concluded? It is impossible for us to persuade anybody to believe the Bible. Christian apologetics, how to give a proper, <clears throat> effective answer to unbelievers who ask us a reason for the hope that's in us is not to twist their arm, to manipulate them, pressure them, but to do what? to trust the Holy Spirit of God who honors the Lord Jesus Christ to make clear who he is and watch what God can do to change hearts that we can't change. It's ultimately a spiritual issue, isn't it? Why don't people believe the Bible? Because of a sin nature and blindness by Satan that only this infallible word can penetrate, puncture, and transform. That's the key to understanding the book of Jonah. Of course, through the years, my specialty, having been an evolutionist myself at Princeton University in the early 1940s, was the genesis record of how the world began, because everything I was taught in the science department at the university there, in the courses on historical geology and paleontology, came to this conclusion. The world came into being through billions of years by purely irrational chance combinations of events with no planner, no designer, no creator, no miracles ever anywhere. I mean, there was no discussion of that. You say, what an awful place Princeton University must have been. Now, I have worse news for you. All the major universities in the world, of course, except I'm sure your local universities here in Minnesota, <laughs> are overwhelmingly anti-supernatural revelation and creation and redemption. Why? This is Satan's world, friends. I mean, the Lord Jesus made it clear that he is the God of this world. How did he get to be the God of this world? Well, we gave it to him in the persons of Adam and Eve who believed him rather than their God. And we are repeat performances every hour. We live, move, and breathe in this planet of what Adam and Eve did. And Isaiah 53 says so. We've all turned to our own way. And every hour we ignore him, if not openly deny him. And God will have someday a reckoning with people who haven't come to him on his terms at the cross through the blood of Christ and his redemption. The whole issue of how the world began, you see, is just the same problem we face in Jonah. I mean, is there a living God who can do miracles? Is there a miracle working God? Well, in our textbook, The Early Earth, We've attempted to show that the Bible insists that there's no compromise possible. The whole universe, all of it, every part of it, every angel, human beings, every planet, every moon, every star, every galaxy, every plant, every animal were supernaturally created instantly by the mere spoken word of an omnipotent God. That's Psalm 33, 6 and 9 in the light of Hebrews 11.3 and Genesis 1 and Exodus 20.11 and all the other passages, the whole Bible says you must believe this, that God himself 
without consulting with any committee, without overcoming opposition, without requiring billions of years, just because of who he is, created these magnificent things in six literal 24 hours. And the real problem is, how come he took that long if he's that powerful? <laughs> and there are other reasons why he decided to take a whole week, namely to, comp to, to accommodate his weak, feeble people, Israel, who couldn't do things like he did instantly and without rest. So he stretched out his work over a whole week and actually rested a day, quote unquote, and said, you follow my model of work and rest and let's walk together through life, Israel, my people. Another thing that has fascinated me for years, that flood by which he destroyed the world in the days of Noah, and what God did through a mountain covering, year-long global catastrophe of water in terms of trillions of plants and animals smashed and fossilized into the crust of the earth and the drastic change of climate, topography, geography, an overwhelming supernatural catastrophe whereby God changed the world. Friends, if you don't believe in the kind of a God the Bible introduces himself to be in this book, forget the Genesis flood, Noah's Ark, it's hopeless absurdity. We all have a real decision to make, see along these lines. Now here's something children are being bombarded with everywhere today. Anybody ever heard of Jurassic Park? How about the lost world? Well, the Bible says there was a lost world. It perished. There was no Jurassic Park. <laughs> but there were dinosaurs on this planet created by God, the same time he created <clears throat> other animals and human beings. And uh, Norma has written a fascinating book for children, Those Mysterious Dinosaurs, now in six languages, and just about to come off the press in the Russian edition. I guarantee, friends, that 100 million young Russians out of the nearly 300 million that are in that vast portion of our world are fascinated with dinosaurs also. Where did they come from? What were they like? What finally happened to them? A biblical approach for children, their parents, and teachers. Anybody who can say something intelligent and God-honoring about the origin, nature, and destiny of dinosaurs will have and be able to hold the attention of any child in the world long enough to tell them the secret of how it happened through Christ the Creator who came through his death to solve the sin problem that brought the curse in the first place and the final extinction of these amazing animals. You see friends, let's face it, the whole Bible stands or falls together if you don't believe Genesis 1-1, forget Jonah. Forget the resurrection that Jonah illustrates. Forget redemption. Forget it all. You have to take the whole thing together. Now, friends, let's say it this way. The book of Jonah introduces us to a time in the history of Israel <coughs> when there is tremendous stress and overwhelming tragedy looming on the horizon that would bring ultimate final disaster to the northern ten tribes of Israel. Now Judah's judgment was delayed, you see, 140 years by the mercy of God because uh, Jerusalem, the capital, city of Judah happened to have at this time of crisis that we're describing a king who at least momentarily said I believe God and his name was Hezekiah he opened this blasphemous challenge from the king of Assyria Sennacherib and uh, his great military general and uh, he said, Lord, we, we can't handle it. You and you alone can rescue us. And God said, well, just for that act of faith, I will totally destroy the Assyrian army 
and in one night he wiped out 185,000 Assyrian soldiers and Sennacherib staggered back to Nineveh all alone somewhat embarrassed when people said where's your army I want you to know friends that was a stupendous miracle and Hezekiah loomed large in the whole ancient Near East as one who somehow by magical formulas or something that pagans couldn't quite fathom was able to wipe out a whole army and they flocked to Jerusalem to find out what his secret was nobody liked the Assyrians anyway including the Babylonians but friends what happened in Jerusalem on that occasion never happened in Israel up north there's the capital city Samaria and their horrible horrible things had been going on already for nearly 200 years well you remember how it started don't you Jeroboam the first split the kingdom and took the ten tribes of the north with him and set up an apostate rival worship center at Bethel and another one way up here in the north and forced the people to shift the day when worship would be held and selected a whole new group of priests and had a whole new system of sacrifices in other words a pagan substitute false religion horror of horrors Jeroboam the first he is ever more remembered in the Old Testament as the one who called caused Israel to sin well friends it got worse and worse and finally in the 800s BC in the days of Elijah and Elisha appeared a whole dynasty of Baal worshiping blasphemers starting with Omri and his son Ahab who married Jezebel now she brought with her from Phoenicia from Tyre in Sidon 800 false prophets I mean she was a zealous missionary for her god Baal priests of Baal and of the Asherah that is the female consort of Baal and she wanted to take over the whole nation of Israel for her god up north in Phoenicia well of course we know how Elijah stood against her at least up to a point and finally collapsed in the presence of this arrogant uh, denier of the God of Israel and fled all the way down here to Beersheba where God had to send an angel to comfort him and feed him and calm him down and then off to Sinai for re-instructions and uh, to be reinstituted into the ministry that's how powerful and threatening Baal was well of course we know what happened to Ahab don't we he won a great victory against the Assyrian king at the Battle of Karkar in 853 BC but 12 years later reality finally came upon the tribes of Israel because uh, when his two sons died first Ahaziah who lasted only two years and fell out of a window and Elijah cursed him and he died and then his brother Jehoram for ten years and then what happened a Baal hating military general by the name of Jehu toppled the kingdom and killed Jezebel and wiped out all the Baal priests and had a bloodbath in Israel and we are going to say praise the Lord at last there's truth and there's revival no God honored Jehu's zeal against a false god by giving him four sons who would sit on the throne after him almost a hundred year long dynasty of kings the Jehu dynasty but you know what those kings though they hated Baal as a foreign you know religion were personally godless men that's the shocker 
Did you know something? There never was one king that ever reigned in the northern kingdom that was godly. Not one. Some were pro-Baal, anti-Baal, but none of them were pro-God. Not one. And it's in the midst of that kind of a dynasty, the dynasty of Jehu, that all of a sudden the prophet Jonah appears. Now friends, here's the actual town where he was born and raised, gath Hefer, just west of the beautiful Sea of Galilee in the province of Zebulon in northern Israel, not far from Nazareth, as a matter of fact, of Galilee. And God established him as a reputable, great prophet in Israel in those days. Just after him, there were two other great prophets of God that he graciously sent to the northern tribes to warn them, warn them of coming judgment and disaster because of their sin. Their names were Hosea and Amos. Please keep in mind that uh, in times of great crisis, God usually sent groups of prophets to confront his people so they could never say, you didn't tell us, you didn't warn us. Because God knew that he was going to destroy that northern kingdom forever. And whatever people were still left in the northern kingdoms or kingdom or tribes that still believed the Lord fled to the south and joined up with Judah so that Judah now became the total nation. All the tribes were represented finally in Judah. That's why today, dear friend, when you meet a person who is a Jew, you're meeting a person who is a Judahite who represents really all 12 tribes. That's a remarkable situation that God has accomplished to preserve the identity of those tribes until that final phase that they are awaiting in the 70th week of Daniel when all 12 tribes will be functioning. Now, what then was the situation that Jonah faced? Well, he was uh, prophesying in the days of Jeroboam the second. He was the third of the four, four descendants of Jehu. And he reigned for over 40 years, and he was a powerful king, godless but powerful and brought prosperity to the northern ten tribes. In fact, that's the most horrible thing they could have experienced. Constantly, Hosea and Amos chastise and castigate those northern tribes for their affluence, their materialism, their complacency, their luxurious lifestyle, and their complete disinterest in the things of the Lord. May I just offer this suggestion, friends? That's the worst possible situation America can be in today. Prosperity. The stock market zooming up. Interest in God going down. We don't need him anymore. America doesn't need the Lord, you see. From the top government officials to the greatest university professors and the greatest scientists who are putting vehicles on Mars. I mean, who, we, who needs God anyway? We've got the whole universe now. You see the key to unlock its mysteries and to control the whole thing. We don't need him. You know what that is? An absolute prelude to disaster. One thing God will never tolerate is arrogance and pride and self-sufficiency, ever. We feel so sorry for the poor African nations all torn apart, you see, with tribal wars, and uh, Cambodia, and uh, well, just go down the list, Yugoslavia, all the places where there's turmoil and poverty and communist China and Hong Kong and the whole scenario, you say, how sad. Uh, if the truth were known, friends, the greatest blessing we could ever experience, now don't tell anyone this, is what? the loss of prosperity and the beginning of intense persecution of our churches. Right? Three people agree. <laughs> we don't want to pray that prayer, do we? Lord, destroy our homes and our furniture and our cars and our prosperity and reduce us to poverty so we have no one to look to but you. <laughs> Well, that was the problem Jonah faced. 
a wealthy, prosperous, self-satisfied kingdom under a godless king, Jeroboam II. Now let's turn to the book of Jonah, friends, and catch the picture. Are you ready? Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, then what? Jonah. I'm sure you've memorized the 12 minor prophets. Wednesday night, we're going to have a final exam. <laughs> All right. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Jonah means dove. He doesn't act like one, does he? Amittai, his father, we've never heard of him. We don't know a thing about him. John the Baptist, we know a lot about his father, don't we? Zacharias, who was uh, stricken, speechless by the angel for not believing the announcement that God gave to him about a son to be born, conceived and born in, the, in their old age. And how John the Baptist, raised by that godly priest and his uh, godly wife, went out into the desert in his teenage years, doubtless, and became the forerunner of the Lord Jesus. We know a lot about John the Baptist's parents, and, uh, and yet we know nothing about Jonah's parents. Who is Amittai? He'll just go down in history as the father of Jonah, that's all. By the way, that's encouraging. You may not be famous, but if you're faithful and prayerful and diligent in training your children, you someday may be known as the mother or the father of someone that God mightily uses and honors. Don't underestimate, friends, the importance of having a massive input into whatever child or children God may have committed to you. Thank you, Amittai, you must have done something right <laughs> to bring into the world, even in the midst of paganism in Israel, a man who loved God intensely and honored him. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. We don't know how God ever spoke to these people in actual words that they could hear. How did he speak? We're never told in the Bible. We really don't know how God ever called him into the ministry, see? Oh, friends, God tells us a lot about he, how he called Moses in the ministry, doesn't he? He met him at the burning bush after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, which was God's punishment for having murdered an Egyptian in a fit of anger, trying to help, you see, his fellow Israelites being beaten and tormented by a taskmaster. And how Moses over and over said, No, Lord, I can't. I don't know how. In fact, I refuse to go and deliver Israel. Very intricate, detailed account of how God called him into the ministry. Isaiah's call in chapter 6, a marvelous account of how he met the Lord high and lifted up and how he was convicted by his glimpse of the holiness of God and I'm a man of unclean lips and how God commissioned him, you know, who will go f for us. And beautiful, fascinating. And how about the prophet Jeremiah? Oh, yes, God called him in the ministry as a young man and told him what he was going to do and that most of his ministry would be negative. And, and Jeremiah said, but I'm, you know, just a child. And God said, but that's all right. I'll take care of you. Just like he said to Moses, I know you're not eloquent, but who made man's mouth? I'll take charge of your mouth. See, and Jeremiah, I'll take care of your youthfulness and your personal weakness. I specialize in weak people, humble people, inadequate people who just trust me. One weak human plus an infinite God means infinite power. That's the way it works, friends. God isn't looking for strong people. Have you ever heard of an organization in this country that says something like this? We want only a few good men. God says, I don't want any good men. There aren't any. I want bad people who admit they're bad and trust a God who can change that nature judicially 
by the Spirit of God progressively and someday sooner than we realize totally and finally. Jesus said, uh, I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, just sinners. He's the one who specializes in the impossible of changing sinful people into his servants. Well, we just don't know how Jonah got called into the ministry. You see, the Bible is inspired, friends, not only in what it tells us, but what it doesn't tell us. And this, to me, has always been amazing. Jonah came from gath Hefer. Now listen to what uh, the book of Kings tells us about Jonah. Would you turn, keep your finger here and turn to 2 Kings chapter 14. Second Kings, do you have it? Chapter 14. And let's begin with verse 23, shall we? These are somewhat frustrating statements in the Old Testament for many Bible students, including myself. Listen to this one. God expects you to have masterminded these details, right? You ready? It was the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, that Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. Now, you knew that, didn't you? <laughs> For years, it was my privilege to teach the books of Kings and Chronicles. And so the students were always as frustrated as I was as to keep track of who was the king of Israel when so-and-so was the king of Judah, and how their reigns overlapped, and how long they reigned, and what they did, and why. And so we have prepared a whole chart called the Kings and Prophets of the Old Testament. And we hope that we, we think we brought enough of them for you to use to see where Jonah fits into this and how it all works together in the history of Israel, Judah, and Assyria. And uh, it's part of a whole packet of charts. And you have my permission to take the packet apart and just pick that one chart out if you want to. We prefer to sell them by the whole groups. There's eight charts in the packet covering the whole Bible, but uh, either way you would like to do that, we'll try to supply your need. We want you to see how these people were real people who lived in a real world at a specific time and did special things that God apparently thinks are important enough to enshrine in the only book he ever wrote. Now, what about this King Jeroboam? He's Jeroboam the second, see, now, because uh, 150 years have passed since Jeroboam the first lived and died, who split the kingdom. Was he a good king, Jeroboam the second? No. Verse 24. You ready? And he did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that's his ancestor, Jeroboam the first, who made Israel to sin, made Israel to sin. Every time you hear about Jeroboam the first, that's what it says, he made Israel sin. How awful. A black mark on the pages of Holy Scripture forever. But look, he did something good. Look at this, verse 25. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath under the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord of uh, God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath Hefer, For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. And the Lord said not that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, even though they deserved it. But he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now, the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did and his might and how he warred and how he recovered Damascus and Hamath, which belonged to Judah for Israel. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jeroboam slept with his fathers, even with the kings of Israel, and Zechariah his son reigned in his stead. Now watch carefully, please. Ready? What did Jeroboam the second do for Israel? He extended the borders of the nation all the way to 
Damascus, up here, in the border of Hamath, up here, all the way down to the Dead Sea. The whole Transjordanian region, all the way up to Damascus and beyond, was reconquered by Jeroboam II as it was back in the days of David and Solomon. Amazing! Why, friends, this must have been a great king. But wait a minute. All he was doing was fulfilling a promise God made through Jonah of gath Hefer, who said that this king will restore the coast or border of Israel all the way down to the Dead Sea to the east. He was a great king, a great general. He had a great army. But he was a wicked man. See? Please keep that balance in mind. You say, well, how can Jonah have a part in promoting a program of a wicked king like Jeroboam II? I don't know. God simply said through Jonah, this king is going to extend the borders of Israel to the east and reconquer much territory that has been lost for 200 years. So what does that prove? That Jonah must have been a very prominent, well-established, honored, respected prophet in Israel. I'm sure that Jeroboam II uh, gave that, prom that prophet great prominence and respect. Now friends, this is where the situation becomes difficult. <clears throat> because in this amazing book of Jonah, we discover now a well-established, prominent, famous prophet totally and deliberately disobeying the word of the Lord. How could this happen? He's the only prophet, by the way, that ever wrote scripture in the Old Testament that actually ran away from God, the only one. Now I believe Moses would love to have run away from God if he could have. He told God as much, I resign, I retire, I refuse, I won't. <laughs> God didn't let him. And I know that Jeremiah wished he could run away from God, he said he wanted to. Read about that in Jeremiah 9. And among the non-writing prophets of the Old Testament, such as, such as Elijah, and Uriah, the son of Shemaiah, both of them actually did flee away from the will of God, perhaps. We're not sure. At least they tried to run away from the enemies that they should have confronted. And these people, dear friends, were expected by God to have tremendous loyalty and obedience and faith in Him no matter what the opposition or the threats. They were supposed to be willing to die at a moment's notice for their Lord. You know what? We laugh at Jonah. We're going to be laughing at it. How stupid can you be, Jonah, to run away from the Lord? I wonder what you might do or I might do under similar threat. You see, not that Jonah was afraid of the Ninevites. Not that he was afraid to die. Do you know what he was afraid of? Do you know what really terrified him? He was actually afraid, dear friends, that if he went to Nineveh and preached the warning message that God had given to him, that the Ninevites would have repented. You say, what's wrong with that? Because he hated them. He, like all Israelites, hated the Assyrians. You know who the Assyrians were? They were the most diabolically cruel nation in the ancient world, the way they tortured their prisoners. I mean, they, they just gloated over the agonies they inflicted on the nations surrounding them year after year, century after century. They were the Nazis of the ancient world, with one difference. The Nazis really lasted, say, for uh, 15 years. These people lasted for hundreds of years. The Assyrians were notorious 
internationally hated. Read about what Nahum the prophet says. He says, when Nineveh is destroyed, all the nations will gasp in relief. See? A bloodthirsty, cruel, wicked nation. And here's God saying to Jonah, now I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to warn them that in 40 days, I will destroy the city. Now he knew what that meant. He knew that that was a prophecy that wasn't going to be fulfilled. You know why? Because, dear friends, that was a prophetic warning that was contingent on the non-repentance of the hearers. Let me say that again. If God was going to actually destroy the Ninevites, he wouldn't have bothered to send Jonah and tell them. He wouldn't have said, in 40 days it'll happen. He would have said, it's going to happen now and then watch it happen. But when God gave them 40 days to think about it, that's his way of saying, now if you repent, you will not be destroyed. And Jonah knew it. He knew what would happen. That those wicked men in Nineveh would repent when they got that horrible threat from God and they would not be destroyed and therefore he would have to come back to Israel and report that their worst enemies we're still around. That would have been the end of his reputation. You see, his reputation was established because he predicted that Israel would grow and would defeat their enemies to the east, including the horrible Assyrians. But God said, I'm going to have you preach to them so they'll repent and be saved. He was horrified. Why, he was a horrified, friends, that this would destroy forever the reputation of his God. Why? Because his God was righteous. And how can a righteous God forgive wicked people? It's just the reverse of Abraham who said, Lord, you can't destroy righteous people down there in Sodom. I mean, my, my nephew Lot's been down there for years, and doubtless he has Bible clubs all over town and hundreds of converts. And you wouldn't destroy the city for 50 righteous, would you? No? Well, how about 40? No, 30, 20, 10. Well, of course there are 10 righteous men in, in Sodom by now. He's got a Bible church there and he's got Bible. He underestimated the depravity of the Sodomites and the mercy of God who saved the city for one righteous man until he got him out of town. You know what uh, Abraham said to God? Now, this is almost funny. Lord, Shall not all the God of all the earth do what's right? I'm concerned for your reputation, Lord. <laughs> if the word gets around you destroyed that city when there are righteous people in it, I'm just sorry for what's going to happen to your reputation. I'm sure that the Lord of heaven laughs at more than one thing we say and think about him. But see, that was the reverse case with Jonah. He was afraid that God's reputation as a holy, righteous king of the universe and the nations would be smashed forever if the word got around that these notoriously wicked people were saved from the destruction they deserved just by repenting at somebody's preaching. You see what? Jonah knew that the preaching of God's word was infinitely powerful. He knew what we all believe, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He knew that the word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of center of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, as the discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no man, not even an Assyrian, who is not naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And all you have to do to a depraved, demonic, wicked, cruel person is to tell him about the Savior of the world and instant salvation by God's grace through simple faith, and he's saved forever instantly. Wow. That's how I got saved. How about you? How many got saved by your works? Watch carefully, Pastor. <laughs> do, you, do you understand what I'm saying, friends? Jonah was orthodox. He loved the Lord and his reputation was high in his thinking. Lord, do you know what you're saying to me? You don't really know how bad those people are, do you? Because, friends, 
the Assyrians back in the 8th century, a hundred years earlier, had come and completely defeated the Jews under the leadership of their great king Jehu. No sooner did Jehu kill Jezebel, see, and her son Jehoram, and all the Baal priests, then guess what happened? Shalmaneser III of Nineveh appeared in the west and forced Jehu to bow down and pay homage to him. And we have a bas-relief inscription showing an actual picture of Jehu bowing down before Shalmaneser III on the great black obelisk. The only picture we have of any Jewish king ever. That's Jehu. And Jehu's dynasty was forced, you see, to submit to the Assyrians. They hated them. And God said, all right, Jonah, I'm not going to argue with you. I know, I really am very intelligent, and I know what I'm doing. Would you just obey me, and you go to Nineveh, and you tell them this. Here's the message, real simple. That their wickedness is come up before me. And of course, God explained how to do that message, namely, chapter 3, verse 2, preach unto them the preaching that I told thee, namely, that in 40 days, verse 4, Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, friends, Jonah said to his God, no way. Impossible, shocking, contrary to every fiber of my being. It'll wreck my reputation in Israel. So I have made my decision, Lord. I'm going in the opposite direction. And you know what? He, he just moved southwest 40 miles from Gath Hefer to a place right here called what? Joppa, a famous seacoast uh, commercial center where ships from Phoenicia would pick up the goods and produce of Israel and really carry them all the way across the Mediterranean Sea. Great ships from Joppa all the way to Tarshish, which we are pretty sure was in modern-day Spain. I mean, you can't get farther away from Nineveh than that. God said, go east. Jonah said, thank you, I'm heading west. <laughs> well, there was nothing fuzzy about him. I mean, what he decided to do was perfectly obvious to God and man. Even the sailors in the ship he went in were horrified that a man would dare to defy his God so totally. They were shocked. I'm sure that many godless people, dear friends, and this breaks my heart to say this, many godless people someday in the flames of an eternal hell will be shocked that you and I didn't tell them about Jesus when we could have. You know what many of them might say? If we knew what you knew about your God, your Savior, the Great Commission, this book, we wouldn't have wasted time. We wouldn't have been half committed. We would have told everybody in the world as best we could to escape from hell by believing the Savior. So this, the book of Jonah is sort of a story of you and me. Follow me, friends. It's really the way that most of us operate. Unless God comes in and, and just confronts us and does terrible things to us to turn us around to do what he wants to do whether we like it or not. Uh, there's many things in the Great Commission Jesus gave to you and me that I don't like. Uh, I don't particularly enjoy going around making disciples and baptizing them and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever God has commanded because there's a lot of things in this book that are not only controversial but very offensive and I'm going to lose friends over this. 
and it breaks into my quiet times and my relaxing times and my rest times and my vacation times and all my priorities. I don't necessarily enjoy doing all this thing, these kinds of things. Do you? Off to the jungles of Africa or wherever God sends, you say, Lord, here am I, send me, I'll go. I won't ask any questions, I won't hesitate, I don't care whatever happens to me, I will obey you. Is that the way we are here? Your pastor, by the way, said this is the finest group of people in the whole world, and therefore, obviously, this is a different kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> There are no Jonas in this room. <laughs> oh, hope the Lord didn't hear that. Do you understand, friends? This book is about you and me. He didn't have any problem with who God is or orthodoxy or anything. He knew the power of this word, didn't he? So do you. So do I. But there's a vast difference between what you know and what you're doing and what I'm doing. A vast difference. At least Jonah was open about it and blatant and said, listen, I'm heading west. Verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Wait a minute, Jonah. Haven't you read Psalm 139? If I go toward the rising of the sun or make my bed, you know, in the farther sea to the west, there thy hand shall lead me. I mean, you can't run away from God, Job. Ha uh, Jonah, haven't you read that psalm? You can't escape God by going to the heavens above or to shield beneath or east or west or north or south or into the darkness. You can't run away from God. What are you doing, Jonah? What are you doing? Now, I'm going to give you my opinion. This may be wrong. It's just an opinion. I really don't think personally that Jonah was that stupid. I really don't. I think what it probably means or could mean is this. The presence of the Lord as manifested in the Holy Land. Now that's a statement, by the way, that you'll find a couple of times in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel 26, 19 and 20 and in Jeremiah 23, where they talked about being away from the presence of the Lord, namely by going to some Gentile country, see, where God wasn't publicly honored. I mean, they really didn't think that they were going to run away from the omnipresence of God. I don't think. He just wanted to get away from the immediate presence of God in the Holy Land. And somehow, Jonah must have thought, like most Jews, if we're out of the land of promise, out of the Holy Land, uh, we're just not quite as accountable to God as we would be if we were in the Holy Land. So I'm getting out of here. I'm out of here. Think about it. Now, here's another amazing thing. This really terrifies me too. When you and I say to God, like Jonah did, I heard you, Lord, but I'm not going to obey you. Do you know what God does not do? He does not stop you. You say, now wait a minute, why didn't God say, you, I won't let you go to Joppa? And when, if you get there, I won't let you have enough money to buy a ticket. I'm going to stop you. Oh no. You remember the story of Balaam? The king of Moab said, come on Balaam, we'll pay any money you want. I want we want you to curse Israel. And when the messengers with the money came to Balaam up there in the in the um, region of northern Mesopotamia, Balaam went to the Lord and said, shall I go? And the Lord said, no. That's my people Israel. You don't curse my people. Remember what God said to Abraham in Genesis 12, I will curse them that curse you. Okay? And so uh, they offered him more money, and you know what he did? He went back to the Lord to try and argue him into allowing him to go and God said what? Go. Go ahead. If that's what you have decided you're going to do, knowing what you do about my will, just go right ahead. You say, now wait a minute. Why did he say don't go and then say go? 
Here's the tragic, ominous, horrible thing to consider. When you and I have determined in our heart we're going to sin against the Lord, He won't stop you. He'll just say, in effect, go ahead. I'll meet you at the other end. <laughs> That's right. If I were writing this book, I'd, I'd have somebody, you know, block him along the way or he'd stumble and break his leg or... No, everything worked fine. He got to Joppa. He had exactly the amount of money. There just happened to be one more cabin available. He went down into the, into the depth of the place. I mean, look at this. Isn't this amazing? He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, just happened to be there. So he paid his fare. He had the money. He went down into it. He's going down, you notice, the whole way. <laughs> sort of like God's uh, dungeon for him. To go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Oh, really? Well, Jonah, you may have forgotten Psalm 139, but uh, we just sort of wonder if you remember Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord, Jonah, with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Anybody heard of that? Oh, we've memorized all these verses. <laughs> but when it comes to the final crunch, do we really do that? Are we a model to our neighbors, friends, relatives, loved ones, children in what? Humble, faithful, consistent obedience no matter what. Just because God said it, do it. Most of these sermons, friends, I'm preaching to myself. Believe me. Jonah. Haven't you read Proverbs 3? <laughs> well, of course, he probably memorized them. You know, you know what a, a rabbi has to learn today to become, uh, as it were, ordained? He has to be able to quote vast portions of the Old Testament in Hebrew, verbatim. He knows the text. Jesus said to those men, he said, uh, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. You think you're gaining merit with God by memorizing and perfectly quoting verbatim thousands of verses in Hebrew from the Old Testament, but you don't know what they say, they don't want to mean, and you're not obeying them. See? Shall we admit it? He knew Proverbs 3. But he didn't want what the verse is saying. God will direct your paths toward where? Nineveh. Oh, no. No, no. And friends, God had a great surprise in store for Jonah. Come back for session two. <laughs> Let's stand for prayer. Now, Father in heaven, uh, burn deeply into my conscience and to the hearts of all of us some basic fundamental truths about your patience long suffering with us especially those of us who think we know the Bible and know the will of God that we might indeed implement in faithfulness in obedience what we know in our mind to be true help us now we pray in Jesus name and for his glory Amen